Yeah, I don't think that it, I don't think that growing up in the industry made me think it was any easier or, or like I could obtain it, but it, it actually gave me the opposite in the sense of like, I kind of started out knowing you're not shit. You're not going to be shit, but just enjoy it anyways. Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, brought to you by Sound, Talent Media, and Evergreen Podcasts, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians, talk all about their lives and music while sharing a craft beer. I hope you had a killer weekend. I most certainly did. This Vox and Hops episode is presented by Heavy Montreal. Heavy Montreal are Montreal's premier metal promoter, and I'm very stoked to have teamed up with them for the third year in a row to do Brutal Montreal. This year's event features Clutch, Amigo the Devil, and Nate. Bergman. This killer event is happening on April 15th at M. Telus, and you can get your tickets right now by heading to my website, voxandhops.com slash brutalmtl. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S dot com slash brutalmtl, and you could pick up your tickets. Do it because the tickets are disappearing, and you do not want to miss this killer metal and beer festival that is happening in my hometown of Montreal on April 15th at M. Telus. I'm beyond stoked to have Heavy Montreal behind the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. Podcast. I'm very stoked that on today's Artist Spotlight, I'm going to be shining some light on Dawn of Existence. Get ready, everyone. Here is Dawn of Existence track Marble Garden. Oh, my God. 
That was sweet. Dawn of Existence are an emerging black and melodic death metal duo that formed in 2017. The track that we just heard called Marble Garden is telling the tale of a lost golden age of civilization on the brink of destruction. It's taken from their brand new album, Ancient Arts. If you enjoyed Marble Garden from Dawn of Existence, go and follow them via the link that I have put in the description of this podcast. Massive cheers to Dawn of Existence for being this episode's artist spotlight. Now, before we jump into today's episode, I'd just like to ask you to follow the Vox and Hops Metal podcast on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I would love for you to tell a friend about the podcast. If there's someone in your life that is just a killer musician, well, you should let them know that the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast exists. You can tell them that there are over 390 episodes where I sit down with some of the world's best metal musicians, and we talk all about their lives and music while sharing a craft beer. If you were to encourage one of your killer musician friends to become a brand new Vox and Hops head, that would be something that I would truly appreciate. Now, today on the podcast for the final episode of Vox and Hops' Sober February 2023, which is presented by Pitch Black North, the Satanic Tea Company. Pitch Black North makes the best tea. All of their teas are created in small batches, and they are all ethically sourced. If you would like to pick up some tea and support the podcast at the same time, you can head on over to their website, pitchblacknorth.com, and when you are checking out, you can use the promo code that the Satanic Tea Lord himself has made for all you Vox and Hops heads. That promo code is VOXHOPS15, that's V-O-X-H-O-P-S-1-5, and you will save 15% off of your entire purchase. I'm very, very stoked to have Pitch Black North presenting Vox and Hops' Sober February. Now, today on the podcast, I am super stoked to be joined by Adam Easterling and Mike White of Orthodox. Get ready, everyone. This is Vox and Hops, episode number 396. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today, I am with Adam Easterling and Mike White of Orthodox. Guys, how you doing? Great. Doing well, doing well. Very, very stoked to be with you guys. Uh, Master Shadow, we're going to start over at the beginning. i got to give a big shout out to Jerry Monk, Vox and Hops' metal architect, for introducing us to have this conversation uh, whenever I am looking for people for Sober February, which this episode is a part of. Um, Jerry tends to find amazing humans to connect me with that have uh, interesting stories, and uh, I'm very stoked to dig into that. Uh, but very, very, from the beginning, let's let's jump into the thick of it. Uh, how 2023 has been so far? Let's start with you, Adam. How has 2023 been treating you so far? You're at home. You're back in the real estate game. Um, the the yin to your yang is pretty heavy nowadays. Yeah, uh, I feel like New Year's always start off really weird for me. That's just kind of how my adult life has gone. But this one's been a pretty smooth transition into 2023 uh, for the most part. So, yeah, I, I've been a lot busier than I anticipated for the start of the year, but that's never a a bad thing. My whole thing is if I'm doing, if I'm not doing a bunch or if I'm not doing something, I'm doing nothing. Absolutely. Idle hands, right? Come on. We're going to get up to no good. And and mentally it's going to fucking just drag us down. Mike, how about you? Same thing. Idle hands, baby. It's already shaping up to be a good year. We've already played three shows. I think with with Bather so far. Little little weekend run, but it was cool. It was fun. Enough to kick it off for the year. How'd the show with Sid from Slipknot go? That that was very cool. Little uh, quaint show in Chillicothe featuring the House of Masks. Uh, that, that was a cool show. Sid came out to kind of host. Um, it was us, a band called Swollen Teeth. Very mysterious. Nobody knows who's in the band. Nobody... It, it, it was cool. That That band actually rocks. And then a band called Kissing Candace headlined. Very DIY, very intimate. It was super cool, though. But it was cool to stand next to Sid and just watch a band. That was that was weird. <laughs> it, it was cool. Very, very interesting. And I did not know that you had done all that. That's very, very cool. And uh, as I mentioned right before we started recording this, I was doing my research and I was like, oh, yeah, fuck, Mike is in Bay there. So shout out to Josh, Vox and Hops alumni, um, was on the podcast uh, Mike, once you know, as you might know or remember, Jerry Monk sent me that EP you guys dropped in 2020, 2019. I even want to say, yeah, it's been it's been a been a minute out of COVID, you know. It's- and I was like, fuck yeah, this this is my shit. I like this, and I hit you guys up, and I booked Josh uh, and that photographer that you guys used uh, for that cover art. 
Yeah. Yep. Sean. Yeah. Mundy. Sean Mundy. Fucking awesome. Awesome photographer. He did the bather stuff. Yeah. He also did uh, the record for that. Uh, the Callous Dow Boys band. I knew he did the Callous Dow Boys stuff. I didn't realize that he was the bather person. That's yep. so sick. I literally follow his like little tutorials of showing how he gets those shots where it, like he'll show the breakdown of like, this is what this looks like before the edit. And so on. like, yep. I don't have a brain to like, look at a pile of nails and be like, let's see the crazy shit. This can be oh, like, yeah. That's, yeah. I don't <laughs> understand awesome. how people do that. Yeah. I love that. And I have the callous Dowboys boys booked coming up and that I'm stoked for that chat as well. Um, it's a sober February episode. So typically I ask you guys what you are drinking. I see you sip it on something. It's not going to be a beer. So, uh, Adam, what are you drinking to? Uh, I currently have a nice, uh, Pour over coffee. Uh, the roast is from Humphrey Street here in Nashville. And then I often drink coffee with a seltzer water, and you can't beat uh, polar seltzer water. So, really, is that cold? Do you go from like hot coffee to cold sel- seltzer water? Yeah. Uh, it sounds. Fuck your teeth up? <laughs> uh, no. I guess that I've never thought about how that contrast is a little weird. But yeah, I mean, if you do like espresso a lot of times they'll give you um lemon or seltzer water at coffee shops to kind of be like a palate cleanser but i like mm-hmm. doing like this one is a raspberry pink lemonade because the pink is necessary but uh i yes. like like raspberry or citrus flavored um polars because the flavor is so different from the coffee that it brings out one another really well so interesting that's, yeah that's my thing. I love that. The pairing, the pairing. So we're, we're getting craft. I like yeah. it. Mike, what are you drinking on your yeah, side? Go and show us your tap water, Mike. <laughs> enough, enough of that. That shit. I'm drinking cherry Coke. Coke, <laughs> Coke zero. I'm Uh-oh. watching my figure yeah. lately. Cherry Coke zero. <laughs> I love it. On my side, I am drinking uh, something satanic. Um, Pitch Black North, the throat of Lucifer. It's uh, basically an awesome tea for vocalists. Uh, it's uh, Albertan mint with lavender. Um, no caffeine, no tea going on in this. Uh, Pitch Black North are make the most satanic teas in the world from Calgary, Alberta. And I absolutely love them. And Dominic, the satanic tea lord, is fucking awesome. So if you don't know them, check them out. Really enjoy them very, very much. They've been, done a tea for Cradle of Filth. They've done a tea for Cryptopsy. They've done a tea for Ingested. What makes them... What makes makes them satanic i think it's just the branding and his mentality behind the whole thing he wears like a like a snm torture mask and sits in a bath full of blood with naked women and sips tea and he makes mer- he makes merch wow. with sh- slogans such as your mother sips tea in hell he's awesome very very cool and i like him very much i actually i, I guessed it on his track which was human tea was was the name of, of of that track that i guessed it on so i'm sipping on that i would love to hear about the soundtracks of your youth when you're growing up in your parents or guardian's house what music was playing when you guys were not in control of the radio what music did your parents listen to now adam i know that your parents work in the country industry in nashville is that correct uh, they did yeah. so i imagine there, there was a lot of twang going on so so you go first what what did your parents listen to as you were growing up um the prominent stuff i would hear a lot of early mixes for a lot of different, my dad was a producer, um, as with my mom, they were publishers, songwriters. So they had all the time, they'd just be blaring, um, mixes that they were testing in the living room. And so a lot of the ones that I recall are like Joe Diffie, Tim McGraw, uh, Keith Urban, Kenny Chesney, a lot, a lot of those guys, John Michael Montgomery, uh, Tracy Lawrence, so a lot of a lot of those early '90s, kind of like the original of the pop country movement, essentially. And then um, uh-huh. an outlier that I haven't mentioned a ton. My mom loved uh, "Graduation" by Kanye West. Uh, yeah, which isn't as popular of a thing to say anymore, but um, it yeah, <laughs> it uh, we we used to listen to that a ton. And um, a band called Nickel Creek, who I've noted as being like a pretty big lyrical influence even today for me was one that we listened to a lot of super sick i i definitely have a whole thing about talking about growing up as someone whose parents work in the industry but let's let mike go first the soundtrack of your youth mike so tying back into nashville country um my dad was always super into john prime oh the whole oh, yeah. lot of john prime playing um and then you know my mom was always into like uh matchbox 20 collective soul stuff like that so i still I still listen to that stuff to this day, but 
Yeah. One of the first covers I did with a band was a Matchbox 20 song. Oh, really? Song? Which song? Push. Nice. Hell yes. Of course it was. 1990. It must have been 98 or 97 when we started jamming. And it was like a cover band. And I think it was the first or the second. I remember. I remember vividly. That's awesome. Learning that in my basement <laughs> and then taking it to the jam room because I learned my lyrics before I went, which which most singers should learn to do, right? And it's just anyone listening you should come prepared yeah um, there are orthodox <laughs> songs that i'm like guessing my way through when we play so yeah absolutely <laughs> definitely not as i did as i was older in my band three mile scream but back in the day i definitely definitely learned my lyrics before showing up um your first shows do you remember the very first live music experiences you guys went to go see you go first mike this time around so the first thing i recall going to see was probably like a local battle of the bands and the county that I'm from, I'm from a place called Delaware, Ohio. And they always used to have, you know, battle of the band stuff going on down at the, um, at the county fair. And there was like a skate park and all this cool stuff. I was in, uh, probably late middle school, early high school, but I think the first real show I ever went to like an actual show was, um, it was trivium and all that remains. Yes. Yep. That was super cool. It's pretty badass, that. Shout out to Matt Heafy. Fucking awesome. Fox and Ops alumni. Super cool. How about you, Adam? Your first live music experience. I imagine was very young because your parents were so involved. The earliest that I remember, probably three or four years old, and I saw Joe Diffie at the Ryman Auditorium, um, or maybe it was at Grand Ole Opry. It was one of the two. Wow, yeah. They're synonymous with each other, but um, seeing him is the earliest I remember. I remember that mainly because I went up to him. My parents got me to go up to him and like sing one of his songs to him. I don't remember what song it was, but uh, first heavy show I ever went to was uh, Haste the Day, Scary Kids, Scaring Kids, Drop Dead Gorgeous, Gwen Stacy, and the opener was a band from here called S Hell Retreats. Hell yes. Uh, singing so young, was that something because your parents were so into it that you were into it or was it just you sang and they happened to nurture that? Uh, if you're tying that into my career as a metal vocalist, it has absolutely nothing to do with it. <laughs> no, I'm thinking more to that most first experience when you were already singing this artist's song and then they encouraged you to go sing to him. I, that was... 25 26 years ago so i can't say exactly what influence so much as i was they were always singing so i was always singing with them just because you do as your parents do when you're younger and so i'm sure that had something to do with it but yeah i don't remember i think the song was pickup man uh the something women like about a pickup man that song i i genuinely don't remember anything else about the experience other than walking up mumble singing it to him and him singing it back and that's about all i got in my brain it's one of my earliest memories which is pretty cool but yeah so rest in peace joe diffie absolutely absolutely uh, i have two kids of my own and my wife and i were discussing and there's times that they go around and they're constantly screaming and and it's like you know and they're singing but it's because half the music that plays in the house and i myself scream a lot there's a lot of harsh vocals so, so we can't necessarily tell them to stop <laughs> which you know like stop scream well you're you know they're they're he's like doing gutturals like while walking around with a ukulele you know it's 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 interesting how the influence of where you grow up and what happens tends to reflect upon the children so be, be creative be artistic people and it will shine on to your children and i think that's a good thing uh do you remember your first times on stage your first shows first time performing musically uh was my sixth grade talent show uh me and a bunch of guys and a couple girls dressed up as the soggy bottom boys from oh brother where art thou and sang man of constant sorrow and had like our own band with like mandolins fiddles guitars everything and whooped wow. ass we uh we smoked wow. that talent show for sure but uh that's the er like the earliest actual musical performance I had was I was one of the singers for that. Um, I sang George Clooney's first verse. That's sick. That's dope. Uh, did you, had you been taking lessons as, as was music lessons that became a part of your life early on? No, just had musically talented friends and 
we were all in the same like music class at school and we just decided to do it. I don't really remember how the ensemble came about. I think it was partially because my kid that lived like two blocks down the road from me that hung out with all the time, his dad was the music teacher um, at the school. And I think he had something to do with orchestrating everybody involved, but we were all already friends at that point. So good teachers, people that that's, that's what the world needs. The teachers that will go the extra mile, appreciate your teachers and let's get them paid more. Please, please people. Let's come on, come on, you know, cause people burn out fast nowadays and they lose the vibe and they won't do that extra little effort to organize a whole ensemble of sixth graders playing mandolin. I would love to see that. That's so damn cool. We were also lucky that my buddy Reed, who was in it, was like savant level talented. So it didn't suck. We actually sounded pretty good. <laughs> he was very, very good. But uh, yeah, that was, it was, it, it's an, a funny first performance to think because I had like the fake beard and overalls and everything. So Wow. The big production. I like that. Uh, we wrote, we, I was my grade six. I went to a French elementary school being from Montreal and we did a, a play that we actually wrote everything and then it was cast. And because I was English and I had a bad accent and speaking French, my teacher, I was a bat that that's, I, I waved a bat on a stick. So, so thank you so much for not believing in my artistic oh talent. My God. People. <laughs> Mike, do you remember your first shows? Yeah, I think the first time I ever played drums on stage, it, it was with like a friend of a friend. They had a band and they were like, we'll book this show and we'll like play a cover and two original. It was it was terrible. And, but my the memory I have from that show was the sound guy coming up and he's clipping the stuff and he could tell it was my first show. And he goes, if you hit my mics, I'm going to fucking kill you. <laughs> and I was like... Bet. I'm like <laughs> looking out at my mom. I'm like, all right, like I guess I better not hit this dude's microphones. Like I'm planning on hitting the drums, but and that that was what I remember from that. Show. It was awful. It was nobody was That's there. Terrifying. You know, it was your first show, but I was just like, oh, <laughs> this is what I'm getting myself into. All right, is cool. that why you sit so tight when you play? That's probably why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, that better not start at all. Snare mic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fuck, fuck, fuck that guy for making your night. Oh, my God. Oh, that's that's so funny. Funny. oh, he knew. He was like, I'm going to get this fucking kid. If you yeah. get my mics. <laughs> I was like, all right, fucking scuzz. <laughs> what? Well, I, I imagine you went much farther in life than scuzz. Oh, so. yeah. Who knows? Who knows where he's at? Uh, you guys dropped a really cool record, Learning to Dissolve, August 19th. Uh, Century Media picked it up, distributed it. That's fucking awesome obviously right off the bat that's fucking cool um as you were writing it i watched another interview in not pit which uh, you had done adam uh you mentioned that when you released the previous album let it take its course was basically february 2020 uh all the momentum was gone obviously because of the pandemic for that record and then you guys realized oh shit we better get into the studio and there was a lot of like feeling of like there's never going to be another show. There's never, I'm never going to be able to, to experiment and move over another big breakdown. Uh, so talk to me about everything that went into this ambiguity of your future when things were taking off and then creating this amazing piece of music. I would say it has a lot to do. It, I think the coolest part about this writing process was that the last, the first two Orthodox records were literally me and one other person for both of them. So sounds of loss was, uh, me on drums on the record and in writing with Tyler Williams on guitar. And then it was just both of us, uh, filling in the vocal parts, but then let it take its course. It was a lot of more so programming the songs in, uh, and demoing them in with my buddy, Dan Colombo, who recorded both the first records. Um, and Austin came in to help write some songs towards the end of that process, but he didn't have a ton to do with it because he came in so late. So the coolest part about this record was that like, we made it a point that, what we thought would really help set it apart as, as well as just make everybody feel like the strongest about it was that we all wrote collectively together. So like Mike and Shiloh would drive down from Columbus to Nashville once a month for like, what was it? Three or four months straight. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we'd come down and they'd spend like a weekend or like a four days, something like that. And we usually leave, they usually leave and we'll ha we would have finished at least one song or 
gotten really close on two or something like that. And in that, I think that really helped. Uh, it really helped us accomplish a lot because as much as we talk in circles as a band, when we're trying to like prove a point, uh, we also get to a point where like one of us just comes out and is like, all right, executive time. Like we need to make this call. And that helped a lot. And then it also helps that, um, our guitarist, our guitarist, Austin is a fucking freak and, uh, can just like comes up with things. Literally he'd be like, Hey, just hold on. And then we'd see, hold on. He, we would see him like this over his desk, just like sitting there, like hunched over. And then he'd start like pounding on the desk and on the floor to like fill some, some weird drum fill thing. And like 15 minutes later, he's like, all right, what do you think of this? And he hits the space bar and lets something play. And we're just like, okay, <laughs> sure. And then Mike's like, I, I got to play that. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Fr frustrating as hell. The first, the first <laughs> full song or the first thing he sent for this album, that was like a, oh, that has to go on the album thing was cave in the song, uh, which was the second single we released. And he sent it in its entirety. It wasn't like, what do you think of this riff? And then we built off of it. Like we did most of the songs. It was start to finish done. And he sends that. And I was like, I, I literally responded. I was like, I don't have any notes to this song. My only question is Mike, can you do that? Yep. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I called you and was like, Hey, uh, what you think? I was like, uh, I don't know yet. I need to sit down. <laughs> yeah. I need to take a seat and think about this. Time to count. <laughs> yes. Time to count. <laughs> Very interesting. A bunch of stuff, as you were mentioning, things came to my mind there for you, Adam, was um, going from like basically building Orthodox by yourself with someone else and then expanding over each album. Was there a certain fear that you would lose the primal core of what Orthodox used to be or what it means to you? A little bit, yeah, especially because I feel like the two albums we put out before were popular because they were so weird. And most people don't think of song structure, and this isn't me saying that I think of things in a better way. They just don't think of like how these things arrange the same way that I do. And it's because I draw from a lot of weird, really weird influences in how I like to do things. So I was worried about kind of losing that element. But I think when we got to the studio, I realized so much of what that weird element is, was literally just me. So it, that just helped a lot because I was like, Oh, I can still take this normal thing which wasn't normal because Austin, again, fucking freak. Uh, I can take this part that like is the the plain forward part and add this little inflection and use this word instead of this word. And it's and you're like, oh, that's obviously orthodox. So like I, the closer we got to a, to finality with it, the more and more I realized how exactly right this was for the progression. And so, yeah, it, it, I always get a little nervous when the songs are demos and they're empty, but then once we start getting close to being complete, especially with Randy, our producer, adding the shit that he added in, I was like, this is exactly, this is exactly what I wanted the band to always be. I just had no idea how to get it there. Absolutely. Shout out to Randy LaBeouf for killing it on production. Oh my God. Oh yeah. And uh, Insane. expanding your ideas to you guys walked in with some stuff and then he tweaked some stuff. Uh, as, as you were saying that, I also, something that came to mind was do, do you think like as long as you're there the essence of orthodox is going to be there i would say i mean i that's i don't want that to sound like conceited like oh the band can't be there without me but like in terms of the energy that's there like i realized that like yeah we had some weird parts before but like we weren't doing anything that was too crazy i think the weird side of it was always my delivery for the most part and then the rest was just like good musicians and that's also lacking in a lot of uh, metal and hardcore is good musicians. So we are very fortunate to have uh, phenomenal musicians. So that, I think, set us apart more than I realized um, in those first few albums, especially with this new one. Like, like I said, Austin writing things he did, Mike literally practicing like four hours a day in the studio so he could he could nail the parts like it was a confidence builder for all of us, I think when we 
were writing these songs. And I think Shiloh, our bassist, who <laughs> he didn't play a note on the album because he wanted Austin to, to cover all the strings. So it, it seemed cohesive. Mm-hmm. Not a lot of bands do that. If people are listening, it's not a weird thing that. But especially because Austin plays upside down to like have the opposite tracking and so on for any strings would be a little strange. But point being, he was great to have in the studio because he's such a good he's such a good fourth head. He's such a good person to have in that conversation. Um, and he would always say things like when my favorite band was writing this record, did they know that they were writing this? Do they have an idea of like, Oh wow, we just yeah. did that. Yeah. He's like, I get to sit yeah, here yeah. and be like, I can't I think believe about that too. Yeah. He was like, I can't believe I get to be the one to play these songs. And I'm like, that's a pretty cool thought. So uh, your, your Orthodox fans that are listening to this obviously understand when you say that Austin plays upside down, but Vox and Hops heads might not understand. He basically plays the guitar upside down, but not like with the smallest string, the, the highest string on the top and the thickest string on the bottom, which is fucked up, but Super it fucked. works for him. And that's just something he did his whole life. Yes. He, he's never played a guitar meant for him. If, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, yeah. He, and it's because he's left handed. That's, yes, that's what... he, he would have to get a fully custom guitar yeah, exactly. to play exactly how it's meant. Because he can get a left handed guitar and string it upside down, but still the nut up top is going to be, you know, the spacing is going to be different. And so you have to like still change that out. There's never been a guitar that's like meant for him ever. He's just made it work. Very interesting. Yeah. That's, I wonder if he could play. Could he play it if it was perfectly set up for him? Oh, you probably, probably sound like oh, shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, Mike, when, when you, you basically found out you'd be in the band and you were building this album, what was your whole mindset? Um, the fucked up pandemic shit that was going on recording this. What's your version of this story we just heard? It was, um, we, we had the time. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, oh, we got to squeeze this in between tours and shit. You know, we had this tour for this record we just put out, ripped out from under us. Literally, we had to leave. We had to go home. And then it's like, okay, well, what are we going to do? So we kind of just piddled around, waited, and we're like, well, we got to we gotta start writing. So we started doing that and then um, worked, worked the stuff out with Century. And it was like, oh, this is like, this is big boy. This is big boy stuff right now. And then we started doing the whole weekend thing and it really felt very cohesive. I've never been a part of that process that was like that before. You know, when I write with Bather, we all do it in a room together and we play it live. But with, you know, Orthodox, it's, we kind of do a lot of reviewing and discussing and like on the spot, like, well, what if we try this and we program it in and we, you know, it's the most efficient writing process I've ever been a part of. It was really interesting. It must have been very refreshing for both of you, though, the having the weekends and being together and doing something creative while all this fucked up shit was happening around you. Yeah, I mean, we we didn't do I don't think we actually did anything in 2020. That was the crazy thing is that we went almost a year without seeing each other. So like they didn't come out until February 2021 to really start writing stuff. We went home like March 12th, 2020. And then from there, it was like, okay, take a couple months, figure out what's going on. Everybody's locked in their house. By the fall, I had already started like a new career and was like, I don't think I'm ever going to play a show again. So I better figure something out. And, uh, and then from there, it was at some point, uh, we got an, we got an offer for what was the Acacia Strain tour with uh, Kublai Khan that we did in the fall of 2021 that was supposed to be the summer of 2020. And, uh, we got a follow-up offer of like, Hey, this is happening again, but now it's going to happen here. And we were like, Oh shit. Yeah. I guess we still are a band. And that was kind of when I feel like that might've been the catalyst to where Austin was kind of the one that was the ringleader and like, all right, you guys come down. We're going to knock this out. Cause I personally had no creative juices flowing. I, I, I had already been like, a little depleted in terms of the ups and the downs of being in the band for as long as I or running the band for as long as I had to where when that final nail went in the coffin with COVID, I was like, all right, 
I think this might be it. And then they kind of pulled me out of it a little bit and we're like, Hey, let's get together and let's write this shit. We just signed on with century media. Like we need to try to do this. And I was like, all right, cool. And we started working on it and I was like, this is pretty great. So it's funny how life does that to us. So you put all these, you know, you start in 2013, it's your baby, it's your idea. And you, you, as it's growing, you bring in all these other people and it ends up being those people that end up re-inspiring you or giving you the passion that you needed to, to climb back up on that horse to keep going again. And then the album's a huge success. It's, I love stories like this. I have a whole topic about something that I love. And if you, anyone who's listening is knowing where I'm going, because uh, I grew up, uh, you know, discovering metal in the late nineties. So I was clearly a new metal child and I've just been so excited over the past few years of the massive return of new metal and the acceptance of loving new metal. And it's okay to, to still like corn people. Cause I still listen to it and I love it and slipknot. Um, it's exciting with bands like Tala, Vended, Vain, uh, low tetrarch it, it's it's fucking awesome what's happening in the music scene and then you guys as well stemming into a lot of that uh talk to me about new metal and what it means to you and um the hate that it gets and um is it gonna pop is there is this bubble gonna pop the resurgence of new metal i just feel like people are just growing up they're just like oh this is this is fine this isn't weird anymore if that makes sense they come up and they're like, Hey, I, I like corn too. And like when I was a kid, like it wasn't, it wasn't new metal yeah. to me. It, it wasn't that because I was listening to like, I would listen to Slipknot corn. And then I'd be like, Ooh, like cannibal corpse. Like that's a heavy band too. It's the same stuff to me. And it's like, you know, I, I still like Limp Biscuit and all that stuff back then, but it was like, I didn't care. It was, you know, POD was the same as static X back then to me. It, it wasn't, it wasn't this weird, like genre thing. You know, you hear the other bands talk about in the early two thousands when it was like, Oh yeah, all that new metal shit's out. And like, this is like the new, new American metal, like lamb of God, God forbid. And all, all those bands, which I love those bands too. It was all the same shit to me. So I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping we're, we're getting back to that mindset that's true it's just it's just heavy shit it's it's all the same where there's just metal <laughs> yep exactly it's funny because it should go back to that because there are no music stores anymore <laughs> there's just a metal section on spotify and a metal section on itunes that's interesting how about you adam what's what's your take on on new metal is the bubble gonna pop i think uh i don't know that like mike said i don't think it's ever gonna pop because you're always going to have moments in time that are going to pull people back to it. I think one of the resurgence you see right now is like the corn video from Woodstock that's been in rotation with all these new documentaries about the festival. It's so good. And like, realistically, any genre of any band, I don't know that I've seen a cooler visual than when that shit starts popping off during blind. That shit is fucking that crazy. <laughs> That's the wave of humans. That's, there. I can't, I, I can't imagine. I mean, I know Jonathan Davis needs oxygen now to play, but like, I, I can't imagine how hard it was to catch his breath. Cause what's the science behind adrenaline and how it, it, it rushes you and then depletes you almost immediately. The moment that your like fight or flight kicks in or kicks off, like to walk out to that, have all that happen you go through that whole big first thing and see it, it it's all done. And then you've got to do the rest of your set. Oh my God. Oh, I can't imagine how exhausting that would be. Anyways. I, I think that the reason that is more popular now is because like people, my age and Mike's age grew up with new metal. And now we're, we're the ones in the bands. Well, it is, it's that simple. It's kind of like a, Oh, you picked on me before. Well, fuck you. I'm going to play it now. So, and also I don't know. I, I, I've said this on a couple of different podcasts. I brought it up on the uh, um, not fest one about how I realized we were going to have another big boom of um, guitar music making its way back to, to the radio. When I saw Billie Eilish wearing trip pants, I was like, Oh, that's culturally going to stem back somehow. Like you saw that somewhere. And that person that showed you that has an influence on you for some reason, I can tell you where it came from. And like all of that 
it just, it sends back to, I mean, there's Post Malone wearing power trip and scowl shirts on stage. And uh, I mean, even things like Lady Gaga doing songs with Metallica, like it, it, all those things are so like people in the middle were like, oh, whatever, who cares? It is so damn important. Like it is so unbelievably important. I don't know if Knocked Loose got shit for touring with Suicide Boys or not, but they shouldn't because that's how that shit works. That's how you continue to grow your genre. And like the doors that are being pounded open because of that is, is huge. And I think that a lot, again, it all sends back to like the resurgence comes from kids who grew up with new metal are now writing the songs that are being toured on. And they're now becoming that group of bands that are being pushed at pushed up again. And it's also in that weird time right now where every band that ever played breakdowns that broke up over the last 15 years is like, we should play a show again. So like things like dying wish. Yeah. Like dying wish going out with Limp Biscuit. That shit. I, I would have never fathomed that you're like, even uh, two years ago, you would have, I would have never said, Oh yeah. Dying wish is definitely going to tour with Limp Biscuit. And here they fucking are killing it with them. Like that kind of shit is unreal and it, and it blends the worlds together in a lot of ways. And I think that that's why the bubble's never going to pop necessarily, but it's not going to be the same. I don't think you're, I don't think we're going to see another generate or another band who can do what Slipknot did where they come out and just terrify you with masks and all this shit. Like you can do it, but it's not going to be the same. It's always going to be looked at as that band did it first. You know, as much as I wish I could be Jonathan Davis, I can't sing like Jonathan Davis. And I can't, I didn't go through things that were bad enough for me to write the songs like he did. Just is what it is. Like, you, like you're going to find new renditions and new ways to do things. And I think one of the coolest records that I think shows what modern new metal could be is unfortunately a band that's no longer together. It's this band called Dark Complex. Um, and I think they put out an album called Point Oblivion came out in 2016. Um, and it literally sounds like if Lincoln Park came out in 2016, if like hybrid theory era, Lincoln Park came out, then that's what it would sound like. And it's unfortunate, like I said, it's unfortunate the band is no more because that had that record itself. They should have been literally famous. I don't know how it didn't happen, but like it, there's just new, new renditions, new influences and like modern twists that are always going to keep new metal being fresh because new metal in and of itself is almost genreless because like you call corn a new metal band because they're, you know, the forefathers, but then like Slipknot is basically a death metal band, but you call them a new metal band. And then system of a down is like, Armenian dance music that every now and then hits the gain overdrive. They're a new metal band. And then Lincoln Park chart topping um, pop act. And they were a new metal band. So like, there's not any one thing that makes it new metal. It just, it is a fluent. I would say it's a fluent genre. That's just like a, Hey, are you doing something different that has groove elements? You're new metal. There you go. Congratulations. Congratulations, you're ugly. <laughs> you hit the nail on the head there. I like that very much. Um, being someone that grew up in the industry, Adam, this one's pointed at you. Uh, did it seem easier do you, that to to make it? Do you think that it was more within your grasp to to become a touring band, to start a band, become a touring band, uh, doing it yourself at first and then building it up? Was it something that you thought would be possible early on in your life? No, because it, I think what it did was it actually made my expectations significantly more realistic. Um, and even when we've had conversations like, our manager's uh, name is Carl Severson. He ran like Ferry Records back in the day, Good Fight Entertainment, Good Fight Records, all that stuff. Our first phone call, his and I's first phone call, he literally said, he's like, you've got the most like realistic head on your shoulders of almost anybody, any band I've ever met. And I was like, well, yeah, it's because I've been watching musicians fail since I was four years old. I think it made my goals a low bar because I was just like, I just want to be on the road and play shows. And I did that forever. We just played dog shit shows to if 50 people were there, we're like, yo, that made my week out of this seven week tour. Awesome. 
And now we're playing to like bigger rooms. We just played to over a thousand people with Whitechapel before Christmas. Like I, my goals have already been met and I have to constantly remind myself of like, Hey, now that we're so far along and like, we have these things to try to achieve. I had like, try to remind myself of like, at one point, all I ever wanted was for like five people in a room to know our words. That would, that was the coolest shit in the world to me. And that happened. And now it's like five people in just about every city we play at know a lot of our words. Like that kind of shit is unreal to me. And like, it's, it's a little depleting when you are good friends with bands who have so much success, like knock loose is some is our, our old friends of ours, Kublacan old friends of ours. You know, we, we see them just absolutely just destroying everything they touch like every show they play is packed, crushing it, can't beat it. So it's a little hard every now and then to be like in comparison of like, I remember playing to nobody with you guys. We're not quite there yet, but then I have to still look back at the idea of like on Spotify right now, it says we have like somewhere in the ballpark, probably of 30,000 monthly listeners, which means that 30,000 people a month, like that's, more than a lot of cities in the United States listen to my band. Like that's crazy to me. So yeah, I don't think that it, I don't think that growing up in the industry made me think it was any easier or, or like I could obtain it, but it, it actually gave me the opposite in the sense of like, I kind of started out knowing you're not shit. You're not going to be shit, but just enjoy it anyways. Excellent advice for any musician out there. <laughs> yeah. You're not shit. You're not going to be shit. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, and then not a more positive look at that is small obtainable goals and then building upon those. Exactly. Yeah. And then trying not to get jealous when your friends are more successful than you. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And I also like, I think the best advice you can give to any musician in that regard is like, yeah, we're all technically competing for the same slots, but like, just be happy that you're a part of it. Like it, it's very rare that like a tour comes through town where I don't know somebody on the tour. And that's such a weird thing for me. Cause I grew up as a kid who just wanted to get there early to be at the front of the stage. So like, yeah. just if, if you're any, any progress is progress regardless of how far it's coming. So I love it. I love it. Excellent. Excellent way to look at things. Um, let's dance into the thick question. The sober February question. Um, I'm a huge craft beer enthusiast, but I love talking about balance and I love talking to people that have overcome uh, any issues they've had. So, so talk to me about you guys being straight edge. What, what is, what is the, where did that come from? Um, open up about that. We'll start with Mike since uh, the last question was heavy, heavily aimed at Adam. So I, you know, I grew up and I dabbled a little bit in drinking, you know, every kid does, you know, I, I slowly, well, not slowly. I quickly learned. I was like, you know what? I don't like this. I don't like who I am because of this. Um, you know, ever since I was a young kid, like, you know, I would always be at parties with my parents and stuff like that. And, you know, everybody was drinking, having a good time and it was, it was fun. But, I, you know, at the end of the day, I was kind of annoyed, you know, always, you know, but you know, it wasn't a bad thing. It was just like, man, that doesn't seem like that much fun. And then like, you know, when I was about nine years old, uh, I lost my dad to a drunk driver and that was, that's a very heavy thing. So, you know, when you look at the whole culture of like drinking and stuff, like I get it, I understand it, but it's such an easy thing to get a hold of. And once you get a hold of that, it doesn't let go of you too, too easily. And I've learned that and I've seen it. I've seen it a thousand times. People get addicted to drugs you know, this isn't just drinking. You get, you get addicted to something and then it just holds on to you. And I don't know, I'm just, I'm very dependent. I'm very like stuck in my ways with like music and stuff like that. And I feel like if I would have continued down that path, probably would have been bad. You know, just, I just, I think I, something in the back of my head was like, you know what? The thing that happened to your dad, like, don't, don't be that guy to do that to somebody else. Cause you, you could be. And that's, that's the main thing for me, honestly. 
Jesus, yeah. Uh, don't drink and drive, people. It's fucking horrible, and there, there's always another way to get home. Unacceptable. That fucking sucks, man. Um, Adam, how about for you? What was that, your journey into straight edgeness, into sobriety? Uh, growing up, my parents were both alcoholics. Um, my mom was actually kind of one of the the victims of like the era of doctors pushing painkillers, essentially like the, what the show dope sick is based around. Um, and that got her hooked pretty terribly, uh, on, you know, all sorts of different things. And, um, so growing up in that kind of household, I realized pretty early on that I had an addictive personality and also I had never seen anything positive ever come from it. It kind of ripped my family apart for the most part. Um, and so I just always stayed away from it when I was 14, maybe 15, somewhere around there. Uh, somebody brought up the term straight edge to me and I was like, Oh, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. And then it's been that way ever since I never, uh, dabbled. It's just, the idea just never appealed to me because from such an early age, uh, I just was always seeing the negative effects of it. So it, in it, in that it, it's still, I don't care what people do themselves, it, but it, there are moments where like, I definitely don't have patience for drunk people in my space. Uh, and Mike and I have had a couple of issues, uh, with other people for that reason on tour before. I think that growing up with that and having that like immediate guard up to those kind of situations definitely has just made it to where people are like, Oh, do you ever think you'd break? I'm like, even if I wasn't straight edge, I wouldn't drink or smoke or any of that. It's just, it just has never appealed to me. So, and then you have the even more extreme situations like with, you know, Mike's dad, where it's like, you know, people who've gone through those kinds of things. And I just, I can't fathom supporting a culture that does that like that, that enables that. And that's not to say that, uh, Vox and hops is like enabling drunk driving because you advocate for like craft beer or something like that. There are definitely different angles to it, but there are definitely cultures out there that are like, Oh yeah, you can, if you can get away with it and do it, you know? And I'm just like, I, that's just not cool to me. We almost beat up a dude in Hartford, Connecticut once cause he was trying to drive home drunk. So that was fun. <laughs> No, no, do not, do not drive drunk people. I'll say it twice. It's, it's not okay. It's not, ex you, you are not okay. And other people might not be okay too. So it's a big part of your identities. Both of you, I think it's very interesting that both of you from the get go, just never went there. Uh, was there moments as you were growing up before you were into the whole band scenes that, um, socially people don't understand that or did you guys surround yourselves with other like-minded people i would say the majority of my friends are not straight edge even to this day i mean it's not a super popular it's not unpopular but it's not like a super common thing um orthodox as a band has always been a straight edge band but um i don't know that the, the majority of my Friends, especially because I mean, I'm, I've worked in the service industry for the last 10 years. And when you tell people that you don't drink, they're like, wait, ever? Like, that's like the question. So it, you know, it's again, it's not anything. I don't have anything against anybody doing what they need to do or want to do, but it's just, you know, just not for me. And I think I, I think the hardest part of becoming an adult with that mindset is learning to be with people who aren't because it is a little isolating because I'm like, I don't want to go to a bar. I don't care to like go where everybody else is just drinking the whole time just to hang out because like, yeah, that first hour is great while we're all coherent, but then like two hours in and everybody else is like smells bad and tipsy. I don't really want to be there for that. So it's, it's kind of like a learning to live with the situation and you learn pretty quickly who can and can't, uh, maintain that relationship. The, the, the Dr. Jekylls and Mr. Hyatt's there. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> How about you, Mike? Uh, growing up, um, did you surround yourself with like-minded people? Were there confrontations that people try to convince you? Yeah. So, uh, 
my best friend and I kind of claimed edge at the same time. Um, so there was always like that connection where both of us would always kind of kick it and hang out. And we, you know, had that mindset, but I have so many friends that just, they get, they love getting smashed. And I, you know, they're like the type of people that love having you around regardless of what you're into. You know what I mean? Like, and they, yeah. and they get it. We all make fun of each other and we give each other shit, but like some of my best friends in the world are polar opposite from me, you know, and we, we just share something in common and we just keep each other grounded. You know what I mean? Like I'm not allowed to take myself too seriously and they're not allowed to take themselves too far. If that makes sense, you know what I mean? You kind of have those, Absolutely, yeah. those polar opposite attitudes that kind of keep each other. Everybody runs into issues where somebody's like, come on, dude, what you don't drink. And it's like, don't ask me again. You got about two more and then I'm done. Cause it's like, if you're not going to, if you're not going to respect my space, I'm not, you know, I don't got to stay here with you and we can take it however far you want to take it. So that's, yeah. I think reasonable people are reasonable people across the board. It doesn't matter what their habits are. Like I shout out to Blake Hardman. He is a apps. I mean, he's literally got a nickname of spring Blake. He is a literal party animal and I love him to death because he can be shit faced, but he will still literally give you your boundaries. Like he just knows how to operate in that situation. And like, He's just an, an absolute unbelievably lovable person. And you would, you would never know that there was that if you didn't, if you were on the outside looking in, you would never know the absolute like antithesis of our decisions on a day-to-day basis because of how we're able to absolutely uh, we're able to share, share the same space together. Respect people. It's all about respect and it's okay to, to be different, but you have to respect the differences and embrace them. And be able to take some shit. Um, you mentioned that Orthodox is a straight edge band. So, so any new members that come in, is that something that is important to the ethos is the word that comes to head to my head um, about the band? Would you ever accept someone that wasn't straight edge in the band is basically where I'm going. We've had fill in members that weren't straight edge. Uh, again, shout out Blake Hartman. Um, but the, you know, in terms of like being a full time member where we're like, bringing you into the studio and you're going to be on every tour. You're going to be helping us write and so on. We have always kind of just made the decision of like, this band has been a straight edge band for the entirety of it. And we, as a collective, like all share very sound, like similar reasons behind why we are straight edge. So we feel like adding somebody to a permanent dynamic that doesn't share that same belief would potentially down the line cause an issue that there just doesn't need to be. So in terms of actual permanent members, we've always said that they need to be of, of the same mindset. I have one last question. I typically wrap up with uh, what are your hangover cures? That does not apply here. Uh, so I'll wrap up with a new thing that I'm doing. I have a new segment called Fight the Hops, uh, where I ask guests, uh, what is something, a small goal that you're working on that you hope to accomplish within the next few months? Could be anything. It could be anything. You know, you're basically fighting the hops. So, so we'll start with, uh, with Mike. What, what is your small goal that you're hoping to attain and achieve within the next few months? Your Fight the Hops. Next few months, man, I got to... I got to trim down on the, on some drum sets. I got a clean house. I got to get, get ready for tour. <laughs> I got, I got to get rid of some shit, man. It's uh, I think that's always, that's always a fun goal to have. You, you stand back, you go, I got too much shit. So that, that, oh, yeah. that's a fun little goal to have before tour. You know, you're, you're getting ready. You're like, man, I could, I could have some extra money. I could uh, get rid of some of this stuff. So if anybody out there's looking to buy some drums, I've, I've got some shit. Very cool. I like that. <laughs> Purge people. We need less things in our lives. Uh, Adam, fight the hops. What are you up to? Oh, man. Um, I have a couple of clients that I was hoping to get under contract for a house before leaving for tour. So that'd be pretty cool because then in the middle of the tour, I get like a nice paycheck. Um, but aside from that, really just getting through the tour is going to be great because uh, <laughs> winter tours suck dick mm-hmm. mentally 
aside from that, I think one of my biggest goals was wrapped up today is we've been on a desperate, like not desperate, but on like a pretty heavy search to find like a new like agent representation. And we all like, we kind of wrap that up today and are already working on some really cool shit for the rest of the year. So that's a, a huge weight off my shoulders for the day. So. Oh, yes. Congrats on that. I hope Orthodox comes to Montreal. I'll come hang out with you. I would you. love I'll to come some, to Montreal. Some satanic tea. Uh, we could we could have another chat. I would like that very, very much. Uh, Adam, Mike, thank you so, so much for taking the time, talking to me about your lives, music, about uh, being straight edge. Uh, I think it's very important to shine light on everybody's story. And uh, I had a great time. I hope you guys did as well. Everyone check out Learning to Dissolve. You won't regret it. It's amazing. Cheers. Massive cheers. Nice. Yes. Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right to the end. You know that I love and appreciate that. Man, this was an awesome conversation. I'm so damn stoked that Jerry Monk, Vox and Hops' is metal architect, introduced me to Adam and Mike. Uh, what a great conversation about sobriety, uh, the importance of sobriety for their lives and the band in general. I just thought that was super interesting. I also really appreciated their insight into the return of new metal. Uh, after the conversation, I actually pondered upon what we discussed in this episode, and I think that Adam was absolutely right. People that grow up listening to music and then start playing their own music, they're obviously going to dig into their personal experiences and their personal music preferences to create something new. So it has been 20 years that new Metal had a boom, and so it only makes sense that now these kids that grew up on all of these killer bands such as Slipknot and Korn and Deftones, they're all making their own new versions of it. I think it's amazing. I hadn't thought about that, so excellent, excellent insight right there on the return of new Metal, Adam. Massive, massive thanks to to Adam and Mike for hanging out with me and being super honest and open. I can't say thank you enough. Go and check out Orthodox People if you have not already. Now, if you enjoyed this Vox and Hops episode, you should sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast's mailing list. You can do that on my website, voxandhops.com. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S.com. And when you do that, you shall receive one email a week that contains all of the details of everything that has been happening in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. You'll get to see which episodes I dropped recently. You'll get to see which episodes I have coming up. You will also get to hear about any projects that I have in the works before I announce them to the public. And I am working on three massive projects right now, and I've been hinting at them in the newsletter. You also get to see which albums the Vox and Hops album review crew have reviewed recently, and you will also get to see which albums Jerry Monk, Vox and Hops' metal architect, has added to the Brutal Awakenings playlist. If you are looking for some new music to listen to, well, look no further. The Brutal Awakenings playlist is packed with the freshest, the coolest, the most extreme new music releases every week, and it's available on Apple Music and Spotify. There's always a lot of things going on in the world of the Vox and Hops metal podcast, and I hate when you miss a single thing. Thing, so please sign up to the mailing list. The Vox and Hospital podcast is brought to you by Sound Talent Media and Evergreen Podcasts. I hope you have a killer rest of the week. I will be back next week with one episode on Tuesday with Daniel Decay of Exciter. But until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hops heads. Oh,